Father, from the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. We glorify you, Heavenly Father, for you raise up sinners to sainthood in response to their repentance and from the boundless creativeness of your compassion and merciful ways, whether we live in the depth of depravity or in the peace of prayer. You know our heart, and you call us forth into your marvelous light. We see your unfathomable love illustrated so clearly in the lives of the penitent St. Mary of Egypt and the priest St. Zosimus. We therefore exalt you, gracious Father, and cry out to your holy saints, saying, Rejoice, St. Mary, beloved penitent and giver of hope. Rejoice, St. Zosimus, humble priest and finder of true holiness. Rejoice, unity of all saints, from every walk of life. Forgive me for God's sake, said St. Mary, when she was found by St. Zosimus in the desert beyond the Jordan River. Indeed, forgive us, holy saints of God, as we approach you with our praises and supplications. Forgive us in the name of God, for we are sinful men and women, and we humbly bow down before you. Henceforth, let all repentance say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner as we devotedly bring forth words of praise to God's wonderful sayings. Rejoice, for you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Rejoice, for you pour out your blessings upon us. Rejoice, for you left behind your former pursuits. Rejoice, for you satisfied your spiritual thirst in the desert. Rejoice, for you understood each other's desire for purity. Rejoice, for you beheld each other's holiness of life. Rejoice, for God filled you with interior peace and beauty. Rejoice, for your repentance and humility were acceptable. Rejoice, for you fill us with awe and inspiration. Rejoice, for you accept our quest for spiritual prosperity. Rejoice, for God shines his wisdom and forgiveness through you. Rejoice, for you manifested the church in a wilderness gathering. Rejoice, unity of all saints from every walk of life. O Saint Mary of Egypt, holy desert dweller, May we not depart this life until we understand the ways of repentance and the benefits of prayer. To that end, may we also not live another day devoid of your guidance. Lead us beyond the dreadful sins of our disobedience and above the plateau of any spirituality gained thus far. Let us touch your feet in veneration of your holiness, St. Mary, as we reach out from our entrenched and habitual wickedness we implore you to cause the desert sun to burn away the coarseness of our conduct and melt the hardness of our hearts so that we may assemble in peace and say to one another, Alleluia. The fruit of your repentance, blessed Hermitus, provides holy nourishment for all those enslaved by to character defects and demonic tendencies. Many people are poisoned and corrupted, not only by carnality, but by escapism and intellectualism. Among believers and unbelievers, there is widespread starvation for purity and serenity. We therefore turn to you, St. Mary, hoping to receive the fruits of your labor, so that we might partake of holiness and offer your rightful praises in return. Rejoice, holy desert mother, for the modern world is refreshed by your fruitful austerity. Rejoice, woman of prayer, for the church celebrates your feats of piety during great Lent. Rejoice, godly-minded penitents, for the consequences of your solitude are of comfort to many. Rejoice, grace-filled servant of God, for the results of your obedience bring hope to all. Rejoice, for God blessed you with spiritual insight, and we turn to you with our defects. Rejoice, God fed you with his word, and we run to you with our heartache. Rejoice, for though you were driven by unseemly passions, you were drawn close to God. Rejoice, though you sank down to the pit of per perversion, you found your true purpose in prayer. Rejoice, for the power and mercy of God were confirmed in your life. Rejoice, for you spurned the lies of Satan and kept your eyes <clears throat> open. Rejoice, for all true Christians rejoice with you in your victory. Rejoice, for we also pray to overcome all impurities through Christ. Rejoice, St. Mary, beloved penitent and giver of hope. Saint Zosimus, blessed Abba, your lifetime of holiness endears you to those who have loved God since childhood, as well as those who have tasted the bitterness of waywardness. You are a light in the darkness, for the love of God's commandments always filled your heart 
and directed your steps throughout your entire life. All those blessed with your holy intercession, therefore say Alleluia. You have shown us and exhausted us that true holiness springs forth from a pure heart until we worship God in repentance and humility. And unless we love one another, then all our achievements are open to delusion and division. You are admirable, for you overcame sundry temptations to which many people, believers and unbelievers, have submitted their souls with either relish or regret. We therefore turn to you, holy priests and monks, and ask your blessings upon us as we offer you these praises. Rejoice, man of virtue, for God infused you with a desire for sacred humility. Rejoice, Holy Father, for you acquired the grace of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice, blessed elder, for you died to self and rose with your Savior, Jesus Christ. Rejoice, monk priest, for you were devoted to the church from your childhood onward. Rejoice, for God chose you for a purpose, and we turn to you in our imperfection. Rejoice, for God granted you ultimate meaning, and we run to you in our insufficiency. Rejoice, for though you were already monk, you endeavored to bring forth a new spiritual fruit. Rejoice, for though you practiced the monastic rule, you sought further in the nation upon your path. Rejoice, for you journeyed from the familiar monastery and into the mysterious wilderness. Rejoice, for there you found salvation from your own thoughts. Rejoice, for you walked forward into a desolate land under the sun. Rejoice, for there you met a living human being who had conquered the devil. Rejoice in Zosimus, humble priest, and finder of true holiness. We see that the saints arise from various walks of life, both men and women, to the glory of God and for the edification of the faithful. They come from respected parents as well as dysfunctional backgrounds, from the educated and the unschooled, from the priesthood and the workforce, and many from the monastery and the desert, whether known or unknown to us. Their constant prayer enable us to say, Alleluia. St. Mary and St. Zosimus, we venerate you and all the saints who exhibit God's diversity in the creation and unity of the church. You have shown us that all people can find a path and a purpose if only we repent and exercise humility. May everyone answer the divine call to service as we honor some of our predecessors who continue to shine forth a glorious light upon our spiritual journey. Rejoice, Saint Matrona of Moscow, through sightlessness you transcended all barriers to holiness. Rejoice, Saint Zinia of Saint Petersburg, through homelessness you blessed people and built the church. Rejoice, Saint Sophia of Suzdal, through imprisonment you lived in the freedom of unceasing prayer. Rejoice, Saint Anna of Kashin, through renunciation of the world you gained the love of the people. Rejoice, Saint Arsenius of Quinevitz, monk and coppersmith who brought an icon of the Theotokos to Russia from Mount Athos. Rejoice, St. Herman of Alaska, Russian missionary who became a cherished saint in the New World. Rejoice, St. Potapius of Thebes, simple hermit who preached the word of God. Rejoice, St. Fulvia of Antioch, widow and deaconess who raised her son in holiness of life. Rejoice, St. Theodore of Novgorod, fool for Christ who wisely foretold of impending famine. Rejoice, St. Gregory the Byzantine, humble monk of Mount Athos, who gave spiritual guidance to St. Gregory Bahamas. Rejoice, St. Caliph, martyr of Egypt, who said, I endure everything in expectation of the future life. Rejoice, St. Benedict of Nursia, who said, the evil of murmuring must not for any reason at all be shown by any word or deed. Rejoice, unity of the all saints from every walk of life. St. Mary, on the feast of the exaltation of the cross, you were obstructed from entering the church by an invisible force. You were not accepted because you had not yet renounced your unacceptable pursuits. Nonetheless, our merciful God desired your salvation. While others entered the church unobstructed, you were left alone outside to ponder the meaning of your life and the way of the Holy Cross so that you might say, Alleluia. You later said to St. Zosimus, May God defend us from the evil one and from his designs, for fierce is his struggle against us. You have thereby taught us, Holy Mother, that although the devil can tempt and torment, God seeks us and offers us a path to the eternal kingdom where all the righteous dwell. In recognition of our own struggles and in repentance of, your, of our harsh ways, 
we bring these supplications to you. Rejoice and remove all coldness from our heart. Rejoice and banish all competition from our mind. Rejoice and eliminate all negativity from our speech. Rejoice and rid all delusions from our service to the church. Rejoice and demolish the barricade of our impure passions. Rejoice and clear the snags of corrupted <coughs> perceptions. Rejoice and break the chains of our defiled choices. Rejoice and crumble the tower of our tainted customs. Rejoice and fill us with hope and faith. Rejoice and move us to repent and pray. Rejoice and encourage us to persevere and overcome. Rejoice and lead us to victory through the cross of Christ. Rejoice, St. Mary, beloved penitent and giver of hope. As you lamented your former pursuit, St. Mary, you saw an icon of the Holy Theotokos. Then with deep faith and profound humility, you repented before the mother of God and you implored her mercy upon your grievous condition. You asked her to open the doors of the church to you so that for the first time in your life, you could truly say, Hallelujah. Saint Mary, you were then included with the others who were entering the church to celebrate the feast of the exaltation of the cross. Your repentance was accepted and you were able to understand the life-giving power of the Holy Cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. You dedicated yourself to the Virgin Mother, referring to her as the acceptress of repentance. In a like manner, may we all bow to the Theotokos today with heartfelt praises. Rejoice, Mother of God, for your innocent son calls sinners to repentance. Rejoice, Virgin Birth Giver, for your pity extends to those who have defiled their purity. Rejoice, for you offer help to those who have no other resources. Rejoice, for you accept the repentance of the most dis disgraceful. Rejoice, for you desire the salvation of all the possessed. Rejoice, for you take back what the devil has captured. Rejoice, for you commiserate with the turmoil of the human heart. Rejoice, for you understand the misperceptions of the mortal mind. Rejoice, for you hear those who pray, pray with sincere words. Rejoice, for you lift up those who admit their failings. Rejoice, St. Mary of Egypt is the fruit of your mercy. Rejoice, for you instilled within her confidence in your compassion. Rejoice, acceptance of repentance who opened the doors of the church to St. Mary of Egypt. St. <coughs> Mary, you devotedly prayed to the Theotokos for guidance. From that day onward and throughout the remainder of your life of solitude, you all, your only desire was to please God and to honor the wishes of the Holy Virgin Mother. This new pursuit led you into the desert beyond the Jordan River, where you would pray unceasingly and continue to say, Alleluia. Never again did you see another human being, not until many years later when you were found by St. Zosimus, or you were first in prayer and fasting, or the image of the icon of the Mother of God, as you worked out your salvation, in the arena of the desert, hidden in Christ. We therefore beseech your acceptance, St. Mary of Egypt, of our earnest praises. Rejoice, brilliant sun ray of repentance. Rejoice, desert lily of humility. Rejoice, firm rock of faith. Rejoice, spacious sky of hope. Rejoice, amazing variety of creation. Rejoice, glad receiver of salvation. Rejoice, sturdy root of unity. Rejoice, lasting fragrance of prayer. Rejoice, luminous star of vigilance. Rejoice, splendid morning of obedience. Rejoice, pure oasis of victory. Rejoice, enduring vine of sanctity. Rejoice, Saint Mary, beloved penitent and giver of hope. Saint Zosimus, lover of God since childhood, you reach the peak of spirituality in accordance with rules and standards as well as through study of the scriptures. However, since it is the way of Satan to especially target those who love God, the evil one planted within you germs of pride in your achievements, you began to regard yourself as perfect and not in need of any assistance. Is there a man in the desert who has surpassed me? Nonetheless, God had compassion upon your struggle, and you said, Alleluia. An angel came to you and directed you to undertake a spiritual journey, leaving behind your former pursuits and opening your heart to learn the merciful ways of God through someone who had conquered the devil. 
We marvel at God's tender care of his beloved ones and his calling forth of all sinners to salvation. For this reason, fa for this reason Father Zosimus, we bring rightful praises to you. Rejoice, for an angel guided your steps. Rejoice, for you humbly proceeded as instructed. Rejoice, for you sought to live in the presence of God. Rejoice, for you avoided the approval of men. Rejoice, for you went forward into the unknown. Rejoice, for you repudiated the taunting of Satan. Rejoice, for you hungered for imperishable food. Rejoice, for you thirsted for redemptive waters. Rejoice, for you crossed over the Jordan as a seeker of truth. Rejoice, for you entered the desert as though it were a church. Rejoice, for the sun shone like a glowing candle. Rejoice, for the vast land was open to the prayerful. Rejoice, St. Zosimus, humble priest and finder of true holiness. We know that Jesus Christ can cause the lame to walk and the blind to see, and even raise the dead back to life again. St. Zosimus, may our feet follow the Savior wherever he leads. For he desires to give us abundant life and not death. May our eyes, like yours, behold the image of God in everyone we meet, that with you we may say, Alleluia. Father Zosimus, you exalted the Holy Cross and the good soil of your heart. After a lifetime of serving God and others, you separated the wheat from the chaff in your acquisition of knowledge and practices. You believed in God and yearned for deeper faith and utter repentance wandering the desert with childlike trust and priestly conviction. May we emulate your holy quest as we offer you these praises. Rejoice, strong oak of patience. Rejoice, ample foliage of virtue. Rejoice, flowing shroud of worship. Rejoice, perpetual wave of prayer. Rejoice, bright springtime of truth. Rejoice, delicate scent of devotion. Rejoice, rich reservoir of songs. Rejoice, golden vessel of blessing. Rejoice, ready seeker of righteousness. Rejoice, new virgin, new journey of faith. Rejoice, full prophet of consecration. Rejoice, pure heart of renewal. Rejoice, Saint Zosimus, humble priest and finder of true holiness. The lives of Saint Mary of Egypt and Saint Zosimus demonstrate the sovereignty of God over his creation. God created male and female, and both can attain to true holiness through repentance and humility. Let us not puff ourselves up in superficial adherence to rules, or delude ourselves in the adoption of false spiritual notions, or surrender ourselves to worldly systems of thought. For all these things can be achieved without purity of heart. Instead, let us emulate St. Mary and St. Zosimus who intercede for us as they say, Alleluia. All the saints were clean of heart, no matter their walk of life, or their family history, or their cultural heritage. Nobody is instantly acceptable by birthright, and no seeker is unacceptable if they repent of their former pursuits. With this in mind, let us again honor some of our predecessors with fitting praises. Rejoice, St. Lucilian of Byzantium, upon reaching old age, you were baptized a Christian and became a martyr. Rejoice, Saint Caesarion of Egypt, upon being baptized as a youth, you made the pilgrimage to the desert monastery. Rejoice, Saint Anicia of Thessalonica, upon the death of your parents, you lived a life of prayer and were martyred. Rejoice, Saint Athanasius of Athos. Upon being orphaned, you were raised by a nun, and you founded a monastery on Mount Athos. Rejoice, St. Leib Andreevich, for you were the holy and youngest son of St. Andrei Bogolovsky. Rejoice, St. Concordia of Rome, for you were the foster mother of St. Hippolyta. Rejoice, St. Theodore of Novgorod, for you were the holy brother of St. Alexander Nevsky. Rejoice, St. Naum of Ukrid, for you were a disciple of St. Cyril and Methodius. Rejoice, St. Doris of Kazan, <clears throat> falsely imprisoned, you wrote a book for children. Rejoice, St. Eutropia of Alexandria, while ministering to imprisoned Christians, you were arrested and martyred. Rejoice, St. Gillian of Dalmatia, who said, do not trust gods you have made with your hands, Rather know God, who out of nothing created heaven and earth. Rejoice, St. John of Damascus, who said, What right have emperors to style themselves lawgivers in the church? 
Rejoice, unity of all saints, from every walk of life. When Saint Zosimus found Saint Mary in the desert, she told him the story of her life. Saint Zosimus was edified by her example of utter repentance and profound humility. Herein we see again the marvel of holiness and diversity. For a priest who was accustomed to serving at the altar learned from a woman who had been hindered from entering a church. Through God's mercy, two people, heretofore unknown to each other, were now unified for a purpose, and they said, Alleluia. Each one implored the prayers and blessings of the other. They related to each other in acceptance of their mutual pursuit of truth and sanctity. Let us also pray for one another and learn something from everyone, always exalting the cross of Christ with our words and deeds. Now let us bring more praises to the wondrous Saint Mary of Egypt and the Honorable Saint Zosimus. Rejoice with all the monasteries old and new. Rejoice with all the priests in every church. Rejoice with all the people during Great Lent. Rejoice with all the solitaries in clefts and rocks. Rejoice in every language known to man. Rejoice in every Christian home under heaven. Rejoice in the farthest corner of the earth. Rejoice in the smallest town in the world. Rejoice by the river Jordan. Rejoice on the Mount of Olives. Rejoice from the sycamore tree. Rejoice at the pool of Siloam. Rejoice, unity of all saints, from every walk of life. Glory to God who bestows great gifts on those who love him, said Saint Zosimus. The Holy Father returned to the monastery but upheld Saint Mary one more time when he went to her a later, at a later time with Holy Communion. Upon approaching the Jordan River, he saw St. Mary on the other side. She then walked on the water, crossing over the Jordan to receive Holy Communion. Father Zosimus trembled and said, Alleluia. St. Mary departed this life shortly after receiving Holy Communion. She was found by St. Zosimus another year later, when he again entered the desert in search of her. He buried her with the help of a lion that dug up the earth for the old priest. St. Zosimus then glorified God for the remainder of his life, passing on the story of St. Mary of Egypt. We therefore dutifully offer praises to these two magnificent saints of God. Rejoice, for you give us a spiritual perspective on life. Rejoice, for you provide us with a model for human relationships. Rejoice, for your ways were acceptable to the eternal God and to the holy Theotokos. Rejoice, for you are of service to each other and to the whole Church of Christ. Rejoice, for you show us that purity of heart is the utmost pursuit. Rejoice, for you teach us that God responds to those who seek him. Rejoice, for you fill us with the joy of repentance. Rejoice, for you endow us with the peace of humility. Rejoice, for all the priests learn piety from you. Rejoice, for the monks and the nuns are encouraged by you. Rejoice, for all the people find hope in you. Rejoice, for the sinners are awakened by you. Rejoice, unity of all saints from every walk of life. <coughs> from, the, <clears throat> from the monasteries to the deserts, from the great cathedrals to the simple missions, the holy influence of St. Mary of Egypt and St. Zosimus is felt by all the faithful. Let us apply their spirituality to our various walks of life according to God's purpose and mercy, so that we may all gather together now in the kingdom of heaven Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. From the monasteries to the deserts, from the great cathedrals to the simple missions, the holy influence of St. Mary of Egypt and St. Zosimus is felt by all the faithful. Let us apply their spirituality to our various walks of life, according to God's purpose and mercy, so that we may all gather together now in the kingdom of heaven. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. From the monasteries to the deserts, from the great cathedrals to the simple missions, the holy influence of St. Mary of Egypt and St. Zosimus is felt by all the faithful. Let us apply their spirituality to all various walks of life, according to God's purpose and mercy, so that we may all gather together now in the kingdom of heaven. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. We glorify you, Heavenly Father, for you raise up sinners to sainthood in response to their repentance, and from the boundless creativeness, your compassionate and merciful ways. Whether we live in the depth of depravity or in the peace of prayer, you know our hearts, and you call us forth into your marvelous light. 
we see your unfathomable love illustrated so clearly in the lives of the penitent Saint Mary of Egypt and the priest Saint Zosimus. We therefore exalt you, gracious Father, and cry out to you, to your holy saints, saying, Rejoice, Saint Mary, beloved penitent and giver of hope. Rejoice, Saint Zosimus, humble priest and finder of true holiness. Rejoice, unity of all saints from every walk of life. Forgive me for God's sake, said Saint Mary, when she was found by Saint Zosimus in the desert beyond the Jordan <coughs> River. Indeed, forgive us, holy saints of God, as we approach you with our praises and supplications. Forgive us in the name of God, for we are sinful men and women, and we humbly bow down before you. Henceforth, let all the repentant, repentant say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, as we devoutly bring forth words of praise to God's wonderful saints. Rejoice, for you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Rejoice, for you pour out your blessings upon us. Rejoice, for you left behind your former pursuits. Rejoice, for you satisfied your spiritual thirst in the desert. Rejoice, for you understood each other's desire for purity. Rejoice, for you beheld each other's holiness of life. Rejoice, for God filled you with interior peace and beauty. Rejoice, for your repentance and humility were acceptable. Rejoice, for you fill us with awe and inspiration. Rejoice, for you accept our quest for spiritual prosperity. Rejoice, for God shines his wisdom and forgives through you. Rejoice, for you manifested the church in a wilderness gathering. Rejoice unity of all saints from every walk of life saint <clears throat> saint mary of egypt we beseech you to accept our prayer in the name of god for we turn to you in veneration of your holiness and in supplication of your intercession we also wish to dedicate our lives to the virgin mother and to go wherever she directs us in this way we shall be blessed and with true happiness and inherit the kingdom of heaven Saint Zosimus, <clears throat> we implore you to bless all our endeavors for the sake of Christ. As we turn to you in admiration of your spiritual journey, we also desire to seek and find true holiness and to abide in Jesus Christ forever. For this we pray, and for this we thank you, and all the saints in heaven. Amen. That concludes the Acathist. I would also like to... Uh, add the prayer that we've done before for protection from the coronavirus because that's the reason we're all away um, in the name of the Father Son Holy Spirit Amen let us pray to the Lord Lord have mercy O Lord our God you are rich in mercy with careful wisdom direct our lives listen to our prayer receive our repentance for our sins Bring an end to this new infectious disease, this new epidemic, just as you averted the punishment of your people in the time of David the King. You who are the physician of our souls and bodies, grant restored health to those who have been seized by this illness, raising them from their bed of suffering, so that they might glorify you, O merciful Savior, and preserve in health those who have not been infected. By your grace, Lord, bless, strengthen, and preserve all those who out of love and sacrifice care for the sick, either in their homes or in the hospitals. Remove all sickness and suffering from your people. Teach us to value life and health as gifts from you. Give us your peace, O God, and fill our hearts with unflinching faith in your protection, hope in your help and love for you and our neighbor. For yours it is to have mercy on us and save us, O our God, and to you we ascribe glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we did it, I think. Hopefully everybody could uh, hear and follow along with this Akathis service and the prayer. Uh, before we begin our, our Lenten lecture, which will end right on 7 o'clock, right on time, I want to uh, extend my gratitude to our speaker tonight, Chorus Protodeacon Peter Danilchik, uh, who is kind enough to join us in this virtual reality uh, all the way from his uh, seclusion in the uh, uh, Vero Beach community of Florida. So I don't know where everybody else is, but uh, that's not a bad place to be, I think. So we, we thank you for being uh, flexible with us 
and also not only to uh, uh, come up to speed to offer your presentation virtually online, but also to uh, be flexible enough to accept our invitation to come a week earlier. <laughs> that was uh, kind of a surprise, I'm sure, when I emailed you, but uh, His Grace Bishop Alexis of Bethesda was to be our speaker tonight and was not able to do that. So essentially what we've done is switch uh, from uh, next week to this one. So uh, God willing, uh, Bishop Alexis will be our Lenten lecture speaker a week from tonight. But tonight uh, I am grateful and, and glad to welcome Deacon Peter Danilchik, who is a published uh, author and speaker, of course, well known in the church, uh, but actually kind of a local figure. Uh, those of you who may not know him, uh, he's actually assigned to uh, Holy Mary Church in uh, Falls Church, Virginia, with Father David Subu, the protodeacon there. Uh, so he was away, and uh, while this all hit, I think that's the reason why he's still away. He planned to uh, be back, but he's uh, not able to do that. Uh, there's a general travel ban for most people for non-essential travel, so he's being obedient in that. Uh, so without any further uh, waste of time, <laughs> I want to just refer you, if you want to know more about uh, Deacon Peter, to the bio that I attached to the email with the link for tonight. And at this point, I would like to uh, turn it over to Proto Deacon Peter and so he can begin his presentation on Christian servant leadership. It is a subject that I think uh, hits home right now more than at any other time since when the church is under siege in a way and people in general are under siege, leadership is of crucial importance. So Father Deacon Peter, enlighten us. Thank you very much, Father Gregory, and uh, thank uh, all of you for, for being here th this evening. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to, to chat with you all. Uh, I'll speak for a little while, and then uh, if you uh, have fallen asleep, by the end of it, uh, I welcome any kinds of questions or comments uh, that you might hope to offer. Uh, what I'm going to plan to do this evening is to um, give you kind of an abridged version of a presentation that I had given last uh, September at St. Vladimir's Seminary, which was called Dare Great Things, Christian Servant Leadership. And as Father Gregory has said, the topic of leadership is a very uh, important one. It's a current one in just about every segment of uh, any organization, whether it's the church or the corporate world or the nonprofit world. And uh, however, we've added a couple of other items on that, a couple of extra adjectives, namely servant leadership, uh, which is again, uh, a kind of a hot topic as well and has been for the past 50 years, even in business. Uh, but I put a third item on, which is called Christian Servant Leadership. And uh, I'm going to try to take you through a few of, at any rate, the, the ways that I approach that. Uh, there are many different ways. Uh, there are many mansions in, in the Lord's house. Uh, but this is just the one way that, uh, that I have, have looked at it. So I'm going to try to share my screen right now and see if that works. And uh, let's see if that works. So, and uh, let me see if I can get this. Okay, there it is. Okay. We have it, have yes. It. Okay, well, what this, uh, this again was last September, it was at St. Vladimir's Seminary, and uh, it's called, uh, it was the Advanced Leadership Conference 3. Um, the first two of those conferences took place uh, 2017, 2018. And this was all started, and uh, it's very interesting that our, the topic of the, or rather the, the title of our organization now is Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative. And the initiative for doing all of this came from uh, one person and his wife, Charles and Marilee Agilat, whom I think uh, many of you probably know of. He's been a tremendous leader in the church. And uh, about four years ago, he had the idea of getting people together to uh, talk about leadership and to see what they could do uh, together. And uh, so he threw, and Marilee, his wife, threw their um, uh, 
Orthodox Vision Foundation uh, began began that. Uh, the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative was officially formed uh, within six months after that. And uh, we have basically been organized, and this is the next one, uh, I'll show you the, the next slide. Um, uh, we've got a, a website now that's been started up called orthodoxservantleaders.com, and instead of my going through all the things that we are doing, which is which are many, it would be very helpful for you to have a look at that particular website. Uh, we run the, organize the annual uh, advanced leadership conference at St. Vladimir Seminary. It will be one this September, whether it's done in person or online is still another question um, uh, to be asked and, and answered. We also do regional conferences. Uh, we've done one uh, about a month or so ago in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a one-day conference uh, in uh, Houston, Texas, and there are two others planned in Los Angeles and in Washington, D.C. However, those may go to uh, an online virtual uh, uh, version. Uh, as well, we are developing content for use by parishes in terms of developing their own uh, leadership within their parish ministries. We're developing coaching resources to not just uh, educate people, so to speak, in the fundamentals of servant leadership, of creating effective ministry teams, uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, a parish administration, of finances, generosity and stewardship, uh, as well as vision and, and change, the whole idea of planning for the future. So uh, those are areas there which uh, we are make uh, creating material, but there will also be coaching resources. We've discovered so many wonderful people throughout all the work that we've been doing. Now, one of the basic uh, elements of this whole function, you'll see right in the middle there, uh, is someone with shock of white hair, and that's Charles Agilat, uh, the person who started this whole thing. These are most of the people who were present at last year's conference. And if you take a look at some of the faces, you might recognize a few of them. Uh, we have clergy, we have deacons, we have lay people, we have uh, men, we have women, we have young people, we have older people, uh, we have nuns, and uh, many people who are in education, in business, corporate world, and in healthcare area. And um, we're all trying to work together. And in the 11th Kentuckian, <laughs> This evening, thank you so much for that service, Father Gregory, and for all those of uh, you who read. Um, and Kentucky 11 says about St. Zosimus and St. Mary of Egypt, said two people who did not know each other were united for a purpose. And that's the whole function of these national conferences and the regional conferences, to get people of like-mindedness in the Orthodox Church and to get them to know each other, to bond with each other, and to ultimately be united for a common purpose. So uh, I commend to you back this um, um, website, orthodoxservantleaders.com, and you'll see quite, quite a number of things on it. So, uh, but first what I'd like to do, and again, this is an abridged version of that presentation that I gave, I won't go through the whole thing, uh, but uh, with apologies to, uh, Alex Trebek, uh, let's play Leadership Jeopardy. Uh, now, as you know, in Leadership Jeopardy, uh, there's an answer, and then you have to come up with a question. And the category this evening is going to be biblical persons. So here's the answer. On Mount Athos, on, I'm sorry, on Mount Horeb, and saw a wondrous sight. Who is that? Can anyone say? Moses. Who is Moses? And what happened when he saw the, the burning bush, uh, he heard a voice come out of it, and it was the Lord who was calling to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he spoke to him, the Lord spoke to him about the people who were uh, in, uh, in need in, in Israel. And then he said something which 
Moses, who was out tending his flocks, absolutely could not, could not believe. The Lord said, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, if you remember, Moses uh, was an itinerant shepherd. He had fleed uh, from Pharaoh because he had killed an Egyptian. He was a man on the run. So the Lord to say, I'm going to send you back. And not only to send you back, to send you back to Pharaoh, and also that you will bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So removed from, from Pharaoh, basically all, all of his slaves and his livelihood, that was an amazing thing. So uh, the Lord gave him some signs, the rod that turned into the snake, the hand that be turned leprous and then, and then uh, clear. Um, and Moses' reaction was the same as a lot of us when we are asked to do something to take on a leadership role. Not all of us, but certainly some of us. Moses said, the people won't listen to me. I don't know how to talk. I'm not eloquent. Excuses. Please send someone else. Well, the Lord gave him kind of a, a talking to after that, and he did agree to do with the help of his brother Aaron what the Lord had said. So he became a faithful servant leader. He spoke God's words to Pharaoh. He took the terrified Israelites to their freedom by opening the Red Sea. He transmitted the law of God, receiving the Ten Commandments twice, but all along, being the servant of God, he also endured complaints and anger from his people. And if you recall, the people would complain. In fact, Moses said once that the people are ready to stone me. And the people would complain to him, saying, is this why you brought us out of Egypt? There are no graves in Egypt, so you brought us here to die in this wilderness. But he was a faithful servant leader, so much so that St. Gregory of Nyssa, in his book, Elect Moses, said, he is worthy of a sublime name to be called servant of Yahweh. We will hear more about what a servant is, particularly next week, during Holy Week, from the prophecies of Isaiah, which we will either hear in the church or we'll hear virtually or we will be uh, hearing them in our own view. And I've selected four quotes here, uh, two from the master and two from the servant who is referred to in these prophecies. In the first one, the Lord is talking about his servant, and he says several things about him. He says, first and foremost, he's my chosen one. He's somebody that I have set my eye upon, I set my hand upon that individual, and he is chosen by me. And not only that, once I have chosen and he has accepted I will uphold that person with my strength, with my power. But the most wonderful thing that I see in this particular quote is that he delights in the servant. Can you imagine yourself in your prayers and you're speaking with God and you know that God upholds you, you know that he's chosen you to do certain things, but can you imagine him looking at you and say, I really delight in you. When I think about that, I shudder. But this is what the servant is to the master. He's not just somebody that has to do things with orders. He's someone that has this personal relationship with the father and in whom he delights. The response of the servant here is, yes, the Lord called me, and my God has been my strength. He didn't just give me orders, he didn't just call me, but he gives me his strength, his power, his energy. There's no self-love here. There's no, I did it myself. 
I set up by my bootstraps to recognize the complete dependence of the discernment upon the master. And moreover, he knows, the serpent knows, that the strength of God needs to come directly. It's not like a restriction that you get once the vaccine. It's something that has to be done day by day, morning by morning. And the Lord wakens my ear as one who has been taught. When the reader is conjured, the bishop says to the reader, Behold, my son, he moves you to peruse the scriptures daily, again, default to a higher office. Peruse the scriptures daily, since we tell ourselves to be wakened by him. And then the master comes back and says, I'm saying, rather speaking, my servant will bring forth justice. He will accomplish his task. And this is a statement of confidence, of trust, where we put our trust in God, but he also put in his trust in us who will accomplish the task. And the one who is constantly brought forth justice, the one who completely accomplished his task, the one that we have been looking for and praying to and waiting for his passion, his crucifixion, for the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives to us this week again in the in the middle of Holy Week, he will give to us this example of service, the washing of the feet of the disciples. And it's not just he shows us, but the servant does, or the master does through the servants, but he gives us the example that we also should wash one another's feet. And you should do, as he said, as I have done for you. But there's even more. A few days later, he goes to his crucifixion. And the sacrifice that Jesus has accomplished on the cross is the ultimate service that he provides for us, destroying death by death and leading us all as his being the first fruits of the resurrection. And he says another thing. If we sacrifice ourselves for each other, if we serve each other, we will be his when he says, when I get up from the earth, I will go to my son. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Uh, it's just coming through a little bit correctly. I think the internet connection is a bit unstable, um, so we're getting most of it now. It's actually, I think it's getting a bit better, actually. I don't know if it is for everybody. Okay, I think what we'll do, Tanya, can you just shut off your, your iPad? I'm sorry, we probably have some competing bandwidth here. So sorry. Uh, that, could, that, that could be. You, you're, you're instantly better. Whatever you just did made a huge difference. Okay. So for me, Maybe anybody, better. I think for everybody else as well, yeah. Yeah, much okay. better. Thank you. Okay. All right. So that's that we've just looked at two tiers. Uh, obviously, Moses and, and, and Jesus and what they have done in terms of, of, of their service and their example. Us. And we, for us in years, the whole idea of servant leadership has taken on a, a greater demand, particularly in, uh, in corporate circles, in fact, first circles. And, and there are topics on the contact of 1,000 volumes, 1,000 books that, that are talking about that leadership. And, and the first that name, servant leadership, came into, into uh, prominence was by the book, by the author of the book in the, in the uh, center of this, Robert K. Greenleaf. And Greenleaf, in 1970, published his book, The Servant as Leader. And he came out with a fairly astonishing statement that leaders must first become servants. Now, that seemed obvious to us. 
and it seemed not Deacon, so Deacon, Deacon, Deacon Peter, it's Richard Reeves here. I'm very sorry to interrupt. Um, we're getting a lot of messages in the chat that just there's this um, uh, uh, very bad lag. Or we're not getting much of what you're saying. I have a suggestion, which is while your slides are up, um, you, if you turn off your video, um, keep your microphone off, but turn off your video, then that will reduce the amount of bandwidth you're asking for. Do you, do you see the little um, camera down by the left-hand side? Okay. At the bottom left. If I think just, I have to stop. I think I have to stop share, don't I? Uh, I don't know. Because um, I can't get to the bottom part. Can't get to the bottom. If you go right to the bottom left, can you see? Uh, you can't see no. the microphone in there. Uh, hold on one second. No, keep going uh, further than that. Uh, all the way down to the bottom left-hand corner of your computer screen. No, no, I can't see. No. Okay. Uh, if you go. Try, do you have a bar up the top where it has options about meeting, view, edit, window, things like that? Okay, I'm gonna try. Here's the retreat. He's in PowerPoint full presentation mode, so he needs to get yeah, out. I'm sorry. Okay, here I go. I, okay, I'll stop video. How's that? I think it's worth a try, and then maybe once you're done, we can try it again. So sometimes I think if your internet's not so great, that trying to get video and audio at the same time sometimes just doesn't work so well. So maybe okay. we could give this a try. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. So um, the the issue here is that many for for us in the church, we have been taught to be conservative from the time we were very young, and then we basically. <laughs> It's interesting. As soon as as soon as I start to say no, it gets much better again. It's very very odd. Um, but I think it's Father Gregory's call as to whether or not we're trying to switch entirely to audio. I think we just plow on. Um, what do you think, Father Gregory? Purple demons. I don't have a technological fix for it, but uh, perhaps if you just want to give the talk without the slides, it might help us. Yes, let's try that as well. Let's try that as well. Stop sharing our screen and see if that helps. Yeah. Good. Sorry about this, Steve Computer. I think it's the internet. Okay, no problem. Or or we can do it another night. Uh, our daughter is here in um Whatever yeah, reason it yeah. says that my speaker is not working now. Well, we can we couldn't hear you a moment ago, but we can hear you quite clearly now. Okay. Try 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 proceeding now and see what happens. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, right now it's clear. Okay. Yeah, is there any way that you could get any uh, closer to your router? Would that help, maybe? No, I'm I'm pretty close to it right now, actually. Okay, let's, let's forge ahead, sorry. Okay, well, what, what happened was that, um, and I'm showing a slide here, which has the characteristics of the leaders of different things like the equipment's purposing, the equipment, of the equipment's purposing, the The Deacon Peter. Uh, and the uh, other. This is Father Gregory interrupting yeah. again. I'm really sorry. But I have one possible solution to this. Actually, a suggestion had come up on the uh, chat box from a very tech savvy deacon. Deacon Matthew was uh, serving during the readings tonight with us. Uh, that's his field. And uh, he said that probably all the fo good folks in Vera Beach are streaming movies right now and taking up neighborhood bandwidth, which is quite a possibility. But 
in uh, the email that I had sent out the second time, uh, and Richard, I don't know if I included uh, a decomputer on it, if you could give him the number where he could simply call in and we could do audio uninterrupted with, with anything else, that would be good. Can you give him that? Uh, yes, I'll send that to you right now, um, um, Deacon Peter, uh, and we'll just give you a couple of minutes to log off this and then just call in. It means we'll only have you by audio, but I think that's much better than uh, okay. struggling through this. So all just right. stand by your email, I'll send it right now. We'll all, we'll all stand by and wait for you to call in. Actually, you could stay on the on the screen share with this and just call in on the audio because yeah. the, the screen the slides will stay. Good thought. That's true. Just the audio. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, go to my email and send it to you, Andy. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Um, it's Lent. We know it. We can tell by all the little frustrations that come up when we try to do things. So. Uh, we ask your patience and give us a couple of minutes and hopefully we'll get some nice clear audio on the good old fashioned technology of the telephone. In the meanwhile, I I just wanted to ask if everybody was able to hear the service during the Eucathist. Any uh, problems with that? No, it was really smooth. Um, from my end, anyway. Very, very good. I could hear everyone very well. I, I could as well. There, it was very, very good, very clear. And from the beginning, for about the first five or ten minutes, I could hear Deacon... Uh, Peter very well too, and then after about five or ten minutes, it kind of changed. Well, that could have nothing to do with with him personally or his computer, but uh, the time of day in Vero Beach and all that. So maybe Deacon Matthews right about the bandwidth issue. Richard, I haven't. <laughs> Sorry, turns out you can't do the uh, space bar thing, we're doing something else as well. I actually am just going through my emails to try and find the original one with the, uh, with the dial-in details as well. If um, Sarah, I think you were on the email as well, uh, and probably great if someone else is going to be faster than yep, me. I have it right here. Yeah, do you want to just forward that? Directly to Deacon Peter, or, or just give me the phone. Just uh, give it to me over the <laughs> over the old. I'll, I'll I'll read it to you now and then forward it to you. I just okay. paste it in the Zoom chat if you want. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody already did. Wow, that's embarrassing. Okay, how do I get to Zoom chat? The bottom of the screen, there should be an orange box yes, that says, I'm yeah. I, I just can't get that on my screen for whatever reason. It won't show up. So if you just give me Let's the Let's just number. try to read it to him, somebody. Yeah, that would be the easiest way to handle it. So it's 312-626-6799. Okay. Is there a code or anything? Well, there's a meeting code. The meeting ID you need, right? So the meeting ID is 886-989-802. And there's also a password here. I don't know if you'll need it, but better safe than sorry. Is 0039-29. Okay, I will try calling in right now. Good luck. Thank you.
wanted to build in a, a bio break for everybody. Now's a good time to grab some food or run to the registry. Just thinking about, about you. We can hear you twice, so I'm going to mute you on uh, Zoom. Wow, that's it. I can hear my second one. Hey, Matthew, any ideas how to stop that? Yeah, put a big computer action just to put audio on. And, uh, so. That's right. Yes, that's right. I don't know if you're hearing that. Um, we're getting the audio through your laptop. Sorry about this, but it means that we're in here. There you go. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I think yeah, I have it. Yeah, yeah, I have it. Yeah. Can you, can you the audio on his iPhone for right Okay, I think I've shut it off. I think I've shut it off. You have, and we can hear you loud and clear. Oh. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, the, the backup now is smoke signals. Um, okay. Uh, where, where am I? Uh, yeah, these, uh, all, all of these efforts at um, trying to inculcate the spirit of, of servanthood in leadership, um, it, it's really quite difficult because there are a lot of people who really don't have the basic foundation of, of, of where, where the leadership comes from, the servant and the master relationship. And the basic question that I have always had, and it's a difficult one because when you're trying to manage people who you're trying to turn into servant leaders, it's, it's difficult and because there is not a whole lot of foundation there of values. So the question that I ask is, where do we get the power to turn from normal life to servant life and this emphasis from me to us? So are, are you seeing the, the slides now? Uh, no, we're, we're not. We could try that again if you like. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to reshare your screen, um, but hopefully that won't have the effect on your bandwidth now. But. Okay, let me see. Uh, what is that? Okay. Um, Somewhere, share screen. Okay, I have to reshare the screen. And how is that? Yep. That's great. Okay. All right. Fine. Okay. I hope somebody's writing all of this down. <laughs> what to do? Um, yes. Okay. Now the thing is, is that uh, let me go back. The connection that we have to have between me and others, particularly as Christians, is Jesus Christ. I mean, it's very, very clear. Jesus says, you can do nothing good without me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you're disengaged from the vine, you as the branch, you're going to wither and you're going to die. But if you remain affixed to the vine, then you will not only live, but you will bear much fruit. Now, I have put together a kind of a six-step model. Being, being an engineer, I like to think in terms of models because uh, it helps me remember where I am rather than having, again, this dizzying array of servant leadership characteristics. And the, the first element of this six-phased model is that we need to keep Christ and his kingdom as our foundation. Everyone knows that the most important part of a house is the foundation. If the foundation isn't there, if it isn't strong, if it's subject to uh, weakness or disturbance and it fails, then the whole structure is going to be damaged. So we need to keep first and foremost our ultimate um, focus upon Jesus Christ. And as he said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all else will be added to you. Now, if you remember the previous triangle had me on the left-hand side and others on the right-hand side. So along that line there 
it's absolutely critical for us to examine our own values. This is important no matter who we are, or no matter what faith we have, but especially as Christians, it's really important because we don't want to be schizophrenics. We don't want to be Christians when we go to church and, uh, and not really Christians, uh, not having our entire lives, our minds, our bodies, our thoughts, our souls and spirit really being governed by the gospel. Um, Saint uh, Avagris uh, of Egypt said, uh, to know God, learn first to know yourself, to examine your own values, to compare them to the gospel, to compare them with the teachings of Jesus Christ, and then to rediscover our own values within that context. This is the second most important thing that we do. And again, it's very much analogous to the self-examination that we have before we go to confession. Now on the other side, we have a really a difficult time. Uh, St. Paul, St. Paul Sartre once uh, infamously said, hell is other people. And sometimes, and you read this all through the monastic literature, the monks are very well behaved when they're by themselves, when they're in church by themselves, when they're in the fields working by themselves. But the instant that another brother comes up to them, and uh oh, they go running to the abbot and say, um, you know, Father Joseph upset me, you know, he said something, and, and so on. And uh, um, well, everything falls apart then. So the attitude that we need to have for other people as servant leaders is to focus on, to care for, and to love others. And we know that the ultimate um, commandment, again, from Jesus Christ is love one another as I have loved you. But there are practical ways of getting to that love, and that is first and foremost focusing on other people and caring for them. So I'm gonna spend a couple of slides on, on that. Now, focusing on others. Um, here is again near and dear to St. Saint, Saint Mark's uh, town, uh, Bethesda. We have the, the healing of the, uh, um, of the paralytic. And if you notice in the icon, uh, there's a face-to-face -face contact, there's eye-to-eye -eye contact between the paralytic and Jesus Christ. Jesus saw him lying there, said to him, would you like to be healed? And very often we don't really notice other people. Um, Saint uh, Sherlock Holmes had a very famous saying to, to Watson when Watson couldn't understand you know, uh, his, his uh, detective methods. He said, you see, but you do not observe. And so very often we see other people, we don't ob even observe them, but very often, even if we're observing them, we're not focusing on them. We're not looking at them person to person. This is brought out again, and again, this is something that we will experience in another week and a half, is uh, the appearance of Jesus uh, to Mary uh, in the garden. and. He says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? For she supposes him to be the gardener and says, where have you taken my Lord? And he just says to her very simply the word Mary. He says to her, her name. Um, and this again, as you recall, in, in Genesis, a man is, Adam is called upon to give all of the animals their name. And it's something which is to express their essence, their individuality their personhood. And in this case here, he's mentioning the word, her name, to her breaks down this, in, um, this lack of observance or recognition that he is really the Christ, the Son of God, risen from the dead. Caring for others is again exemplified by this icon of the Good Samaritan, where Christ represents the Good Samaritan. And you have an example of lack of focus for the two individuals in the back, uh, the, the priest and the Levite, who, as it famously says in the gospel, they saw and they passed by on the other side. They ignored the other person. Uh, they had blinders on. And very often in life, uh, we have blinders. <laughs> we, we look at things uh, you know, in our own town. We look at things in our own church. and, and um, uh, in our uh, office, uh, factory, etc., and uh, we try to ignore certain things instead of attending to them. So Jesus on the left is 
is caring for others, pouring on uh, the oil and the wine, the compassion and the mercy. And again, when uh, he has to leave, um, he pays the uh, innkeeper to take care of that person. So we care for others in two ways. One, if we're fortunate enough, we do it directly to the individual. And in other cases, we ask other people to do it for us on our behalf. And again, that's why in the church, we have some wonderful organizations like IOCC, and Focus, Zoe for Life, uh, or Veras Christian Prison Ministry, and so on, in which we can uh, help others, care for others by asking others to, to care for them. Now, the love, again, is uh, it's not optional, as we all know. It's a commandment uh, from the Lord, a uh, new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And this particular um, uh, image here is taken from, uh, of course, the, the icon of Christ that's to the right-hand side of the royal doors as we're looking uh, from, uh, from, from the people's side. And uh, I, I, I know that in some churches the gospel is closed, and that always concerns me because it says that you know, once, once we get to that uh, last judgment, uh, we don't have an opportunity to open up the gospel. But as for right now, it's still an open book exam for, for all of us. There are three other ones, uh, to be humble, to, to serve, and, and to be steadfast in tough times in this little model that I've constructed. And the words be humble, we've heard those so many times. And sometimes we have a mistaken idea of that. And mis sometimes it, may, it means to us, well, we don't say anything. Uh, we act lowly of heart. Uh, we don't speak up. Uh, we basically recognize everyone else as being smarter, better, more talented than we are. And here we are, poor me. Uh, and we don't really say anything, well, even when it should be said. But that's not the way that Jesus was. Uh, St. Paul's epistle to the Philippians said that uh, Jesus emptied himself uh, and it became, in the King James Version, a person of no reputation. A person of no reputation does not need to exalt himself or herself, does not need to be worried when other people criticize them, when other people don't speak well of them, when other people don't praise them. And that for us is really a very, very important part of the humility. There's a famous story about a, um, a young novice who goes to the monk, a uh, senior monk, and asks him, what does it mean to be perfect? And uh, the senior monk says, go and um, go to the cemetery where all the old fathers are buried and uh, praise them. Uh, and say, oh, you're so wonderful, you gave such great sermons, and you're so pious and humble, and so on. And then he goes back and he says to the, to the monk, uh, the monk asks him, what did they say? He says, nothing, okay. Now go back and abuse them, tell them, oh, you're rotten, you're a sinner, you know, you did all kinds of things, and, and so on. And then he goes back to the, uh, to the monk, monk says, what did they say? Nothing. And the monk says, perfect. And that is that attitude of uh, passionlessness, of humility, that we need to have, especially when we're dealing with subjects in the church, in our community, in which things have to be said, and we sometimes don't say them out of uh, a desire to either be thought well of or, or not to, to rock the boat. And of course, the example of extreme humility is Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his laying in the tomb for us. Desire to serve and not to be served is absolutely critical. It's at the focus of servant leadership. And we all know what Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve. And what I think is the most important here is that desire, the desire to serve. Because if we really desire to serve, Jesus will give us the opportunity to do so. And i just like to draw your attention to, to two women who lived a generation apart uh, in, in Russia and in Europe, and who I think exemplify to me uh, almost a, a shattering vision of what service is. Uh, to the left is um, uh, Elizabeth 
Feodorovna, uh, the granddaughter of um, Queen Victoria of Great Britain, who was born in uh, 1864, uh, married the Grand Prince Sergei. Um, and she was not Orthodox originally. She was wealthy. She was well groomed, as you can see. And she eventually became a convert to Orthodoxy living in the royal court. To the right is Elizaveta Pilenko, later Skopsova, uh, who was born in Riga, Latvia in 1891, and who was twice married. She was a, uh, a teenage atheist, and she was a youthful radical, and later returned to Orthodoxy. And these two women had completely different lives at different times, but yes, to me, they are the, the tremendous example of service. On the left again is Elizabeth. Uh, her husband, the Grand, uh, the Grand Duke, rather, was um, was assassinated in 1905. She became a nun. She founded the Saint Martha and Mary House in, in Moscow, which had a hospital, pharmacy, um, uh, things of need for the poor. She worked among the worst poor in the worst slums of Moscow during World War One. She visited uh, all of the, the soldiers at the front. To the right, now the nun uh, Maria, um, uh, who lived then in, in Paris. She formed a small hostel, and she welcomed everyone to that hospital. And as she said, her desire was to work among tramps and paupers. And when, of course, the Nazis came in um, in uh, 1939 into Paris, uh, her, uh, she and, and her priest friend, Father Dmitri Klepenin, were their concern first and foremost was the Jews issuing them false baptismal certificates so that they wouldn't be dragged off to the concentration camp. And uh, once one of the Nazi soldiers came to her and said, uh, are there any Jews here? And she holds up and shows him an icon of the mother of God. These two amazing women are now saints in the church. On the left, St. Elizabeth um, uh, the Great, the great martyr, who was on Pascha 1918, arrested by the Bolsheviks, thrown into a well, and assassinated. And on the right, Mother Maria Skovtsova, Mother Maria of Ravensbrück, a parish, was brought in 1943 to the Ravensbrück concentration camp, and there lived with all the prisoners until she died on March 31st, and the anniversary is yesterday, uh, 1945, taking the place, as some say, of a, um, a Jewish lady who was scheduled to be gassed. So these two women are examples, images of service of the first rank. And the reason why I bring these women up rather than just talking about leadership characteristics of service and how you should serve is because this is the reason why we venerate the saints in the church, why we ask them to pray for us, because we can look at their lives, and when you read their lives, and I encourage you especially to read the life of St. Maria Sconsola of Ravensbrück in Paris, because her teaching and her preaching is just absolutely, uh, is, it, it really will, will it, it will, tear your heart apart. The last item is remain steadfast in tough times. Again, St. Saint, Saint Paul in Ephesians said, put on the armor of the Lord, be strong in the Lord, and having done all to stand. And these uh, two saints particularly uh, are ones who, who remain steadfast in tough times. And of course, with the coronavirus, we think this is a really tough time, which it is. And certainly for any of us who are affected by it, it's a terrible time. And But we need to remain steadfast there. And um, in anything that we do as leaders in the church, we, we need to constantly, constantly be reminded of the words of Christ it is, uh, be at peace, I have overcome the world. And Jesus, again, showed us this in, in his own actions uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and as this icon shows, where he prayed to his Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thine be done. 
and the t- title of this little icon is Yabonia, and that the agony that he that he suffered at that time, but yet his strength of will and of power persisted. Saint Maria Scopsola again said that we needed to love to the end and without exception, and which she did so in her own life, and which she asks us to do the same. So here's the six-step Christian leadership model, which uh, I offer to you for for your thinking. Um, And uh, it's something which which I hope uh, may be of some uh, assistance to you. The last thing that I want to mention here is, again, a little bit of a plea. Um, Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 48, he said, Behold, I have come to cast fire upon the earth. I would that it were already kindled. Just before that statement, he had reminded us about the responsibilities of servants to be aware that the master is coming, that we have certain responsibilities, and it behooves us to live up to those responsibilities. And when we hear about the holy fire coming on Pascha night and and we rejoice in that light, the light that comes into the world, we remember, we have to remember that that light is also fire. And it's a fire which should not only illumine us and warm our souls, but also spur us to deeds of service, of love, and of caring. So thank you, my brothers and sisters. That's the end of my uh, presentation. I apologize for all of the technological issues, uh, but I hope that it might have been of some, some assistance to you. Thank you, Proto Deacon Peter. Uh, despite the, the technical glitches and everything, you kept your composure and your focus, and you managed to share with us some very useful things. Uh, Christian servant leadership, in my own mind, uh, is sort of uh, almost predicated with the the words of our Lord when he says uh, to his disciples, let he who is desires to be, or something like that, greatest among you must be servant of all. So it kind of is, again, one of those Christian paradoxes. Uh, You've got to die to live, you've got to serve to be great, (laughs) you've got to be a great servant to be great, to be a Christian even. And so you've kind of captured all of that. And it all begins with, as you said on one of the sides of the pyramid, a willingness. Uh, There also has to be, I think, and identified in each one of our lives, a calling to listen for that call. And sometimes it comes uh, in mysterious ways from God in great ways. And other times it comes in a very subtle and small way. Uh, while I'm, I'm saying this, I'm going to invite anyone else who has uh, questions or comments to please put them in the chat box in the bottom, and I'll take a look at them, and I will uh, direct them to Brother Deacon Peter. But I want to say that in my own life, my call uh, to the priesthood was uh, in a very uh, non-dramatic way. Uh, I, I don't know what to get into the whole story, but essentially I wrestled with, you know, the the issue of being ordained, the question of being ordained, even after I had, you know, graduated from seminary. And uh, it really didn't become for me apparent that I might or should pursue it until I had a conversation with an upperclassman who had become a priest and I was visiting him and I was in his uh, living room at his rectory, and I said, uh, I don't know, I don't really have a calling. I just have a wife and a child, and I need to be able to pay the bills. And I said, that's not a calling. And he looked me in the eye, and he said, are you sure? And all of a sudden, when he said that, it was like I had this chill running up and down my spine. And uh, it was almost like, God was saying, you get it? (laughs) Do you get it? Maybe you should do this. And so I kind of turned my thinking around and prayed mightily, and uh, it turned out apparently that I was supposed to be a priest. But 
sometimes we're the last to know. Uh, there's other ones who uh, help us with our, our calling. So I'm going to check the chat box and see if there's any uh, questions here. Ah, there we go. Okay. Richard says, seems like Christians don't need to be nice in order to be humble servants. In fact, niceness can be unchristian sometimes. Is that right? The computer, is that right? Well, it's nice to be nice. <laughs> but, uh, and I think if by nice, uh, we can be polite and we can be courteous and we can be ladies and, and we can be gentlemen. And that's really, really important. But there, there are times when we really honestly have to be open with each other. Father Tom Hopko used to say that everybody needs a soulmate. Everybody needs somebody that we can really open, open ourselves uh, to. Uh, but on, on the other hand, uh, there are individuals, and I, I, I speak particularly of people who are uh, above me, so to speak, um, both in the world and in the church, and also our, our peers, that they, we, we, we all of us have something to offer. All of us have a different perspective. We've, we've all been given the gift of the Holy Spirit in, in our chrismation. Uh, we all have different uh, backgrounds, uh, expertise, and so on. So every single person has something to offer and something to say. And uh, we have to be very careful not to, um, to say things uh, in a uh, arrogant or a rude way, but try to find the right way to talk to people and, uh, and to be polite and to be courteous. Uh, however, uh, I'm always reminded of the Council of St. John Chrysostom where he said if uh, if you if one if a person sees his brother doing something wrong and does not correct him uh, out of uh, under the guise of humility and he says those exact words under the guise of humility that same brother will condemn him at the judgment seat because he will say you knew this and you didn't tell me um, when, whenever in my in my career with with Exxon, and I had probably at least almost a dozen different positions and managerial positions, and I would always carry the, carry, gather my people on the first day or the second day around me, and uh, I list what I thought my expectations were of them, and then their expect what I thought their expectations of of me should be. And I said, well, if we have any disagreements, let's <laughs> let's hear them. Let's hear them right now, you know, so that we don't go away under false pretenses, either of us, and expect either more or or, or less. And, but I said, there's one unforgivable sin here, and the unforgivable sin is that if the people, my people, see me doing anything wrong or making a wrong decision or whatever, and they don't tell me, <laughs> and I actually do turn out to be wrong, which sometimes I did. Um, then, then uh, there's going to be trouble, and the, the whole here, the whole point here is just like St. Paul said. He says we're members one of another, and uh, if if the foot hurts, uh, you know the, the 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 hand will hurt, and so on. Uh, so we we can't we, we we're not an island. We have to uh, be with one another. We have to be gentle with each other, forbearing one another's love in love, as what uh, Saint Saint Paul says. But if we see someone doing something that we think is not right, even, uh, and I, I hate to say this, even if it's uh, our priest or our bishop or your deacon, your deacons usually, some deacons do a lot wrong like me, but um, that, or the, the council or, 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 or anyone, there you have the, the responsibility to speak up in a kind way, in a gentle way, in a, a nice way, if you want to put it that way. But you do, and that's very, very important, I think. Father, you're muted. Am I muted? You were. You're not anymore. Oh. Okay, I've unmuted myself officially. Okay. Uh, Uncle Michael Langosio says humility is so undervalued in our society. I agree with your statements. How do we convince others that it's not only about competition? Because that's, of course, uh, very uh, 
prevalent in our culture right now? Well, I, I think it depends. You have to have the relationship with other people in order in order to do that. Uh, in my own corporate uh, experience, um, one of the key uh, performance indicators that you used to get rated on each each year, Exxon was very disciplined in its performance appraisal system, was uh, you're working as a team, and um, and supervisors were rated not only on her or his performance but also on the performance of, of their subordinates. So if anybody was, was trying to, to one-upmanship the other ones or to be in competition, that was considered something that's really bad. Um, but if your group or whatever it is, it could be a church, could be a neighborhood association, a nonprofit, or, or your own uh, business, uh, and if there is this spirit of competition, uh, it's something that if you ever have retreats or conferences or whatever in which you are able to speak out in a kind of a, a safe situation, so to speak, um, it's something it's something that really uh, ought, ought to be done. From a personal level, if, if I were to know that somebody has that feeling of competition uh, with, with me, for example, and I particularly used to do this with my peers, is I would reserve a certain period of the time of the day, like in the afternoon, where I would go around and I'd talk to people, my own uh, subordinates, my, my peers, uh, uh, my superiors, even that I wasn't reporting to, and so on. And one of the things that I would always sit down and, and I, after I asked them, how's everything going, what's happening, et cetera, I would say, how can I help you? How can my organization, my group, the people who are under my responsibility, how can I help you? And uh, a lot of people wouldn't believe that at first. And they'd say, well, well, wait a minute, I'm in competition with this guy, you know? And, um, but I would say, yeah, no, really, uh, I'd like to help you. You know, uh, what are you doing? It could be really interesting. I, I could learn something from you <laughs> or what you're doing. Um, please let me help you. And little by little, you gain people's confidence doing that. And you break down this this competition, and um, so we really need to. That's why I say you need to be kind and gentle, at the same time that you're being forthright and transparent and, and so on. But it's all of a piece, as they say. And um, this is something that, if we're a Christian and we love other people, um, we need to help them. Very good. Thank you, Bernadette and Peter. Any? Uh, I'd like to open the floor to anyone else who has any questions at this time. I can't see everybody in gallery view right now because we're still doing the sh screen sharing thing but if you do have a question uh, oh well I got a note here that I skipped Matushka Sasha's question which could be very 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 dangerous for me but I really did feel that um, Bernadette and Peter sort of answered it her question was can you give an example or two of how this view of servant leadership informed your secular work so yeah, I think you did sort of answer that, but if you have any other uh, examples while people are thinking, uh, you might want to throw them in. Well, no, I think it was uh, it was absolutely quite huge, uh, I must say. Um, in, in my own uh, in my own career uh, with Exxon, which I started in 1970, and it was kind of interesting because Father uh, Father Alexander Schmemann, once I was at seminary. Uh, for a Saturday evening vigil, and I went to confession to him, and after the confession, and I'd already known him for a number of years, uh, personally, and he, he looked at me and he said, uh, I have heard that you have accepted a job with a capitalistic oil company. And I said, yes. <laughs> he said, how can you, a churchman, do that? And I said, well, Father Exxon, at that time, and still is, a very moral and ethical company, and if I do anything wrong, uh, if I step out of line, uh, I will be, I'll be terminated, you know, and, and, and it was always a very safe space for me from an ethical and moral point of view. But um, whenever I, of course, became uh, a manager, a supervisor, an executive, and I had people working for me, I always viewed them as my, as my parishioners. They were, they were my parish, outside of my parish. And it was my job at the end of the day that they would go home to their families, tired, um, but 
secure in the knowledge that they would be able to send their kids to college, they would have food on the table, and they were happy in the work that they were doing. And uh, that for me was a pastoral um, act on my part to really know each of them, to know their families, what were their issues, and so on, and to make the, the day not such that they came home and they yelled at their spouse and kicked their dog, you know, and so on. Uh, I didn't want that. And so my, my life in the church, and particularly my life as a deacon for the, almost the last 45 years, uh, really totally informed my, my life in the corporate world. And I think what we're trying to do with the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative is to ensure that particularly our young professionals who really, I can't tell you how many young professionals have come up to me and say, Deacon Peter, I'm a lawyer. Can I be a lawyer and a Christian at the same time? Or hedge fund manager, can I be a hedge fund manager and, and still and still be a Christian, and and I say, absolutely you can, absolutely. And what we're trying to do in the Leadership Initiative, and I hope that you go to that site, orthodoxserventleaders.com, uh, and see what we're doing. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give people the opportunity to talk to each other, to be coached, to be mentored, uh, and to learn how can you be whatever you are in your life and a Christian, a real Christian, at the same time. That's wonderful that your um, <clears throat> seminary formation and Christian life uh, defined really how you behaved in your corporate career. Uh, I've actually had the opposite uh, experience with a lot of parishioners who are in big corporations and who literally had to leave because they were in such a toxic environment that although they love their work, the pressure, the demands, the backstabbing and things like that uh, were so bad that they just couldn't stay. They had to either transfer to a different uh, department, company, even career at times. So I've seen how bad that can be. All right, if there are no other questions, I just wanted to uh, thank you once again, Brother Deacon Peter, for spending an hour or so with us tonight. I'd like to close with a prayer, if that's possible, uh, Richard. Maybe we could uh, mute any other noise and things, and we could uh, <clears throat> do the prayer to the Theotokos. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. It is truly meet to bless you, O Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure, and the Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without defilement you gave birth to God the Word, true Theotokos, we magnify you. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, one more question. Oh, wait, one more question. Who? You did say Frank. Was there a question? There's one in the chat box. Ah, okay. Hold on. Get a clickety click here. <clears throat> okay. Can you please give examples of how those of us with younger children can inspire or educate them, I presume, to be servant leaders in their in their own, perhaps more secular way, in school, at home, in their community? Hold on. I think you must have accidentally muted yourself. Deacon Peter, I don't know what's happened here. I think we've lost you. Try, try on, try on the computer. Help, help. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna unmute him on the computer. Okay. His cell, right. his cell phone shows us muted through his Zoom. Okay. Are you all right? Can I? Can you hear now? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm gonna. Yeah. Sorry. You're uh, now doing yeah, through I the computer. <laughs> Actually, I think that Tanya, my wife, should be answering this question. <laughs> She's the expert in dealing with children. But I know, uh, I think that if, if she were to answer, what, what she would be saying is that um, uh, servanthood starts at home. Uh, very often I hear that uh, today's young children are, um, how can I put it, they're uh, um, 
treated as almost uh, little China dolls and yes, not able to do anything. Uh, we were so child-centric. Uh, but if we were really child-centric, we would know that they had to be, um, you know, essentially trained. And St. John Chrysostom said, train a child in the way that he should go and he will not depart from it. And so uh, chores, uh, <laughs> clearing off uh, the table, uh, keeping their rooms clean, um, doing, uh, doing small acts ar around the house, acting as part of the family and taking on responsibilities, I think is absolutely uh, important. Uh, when they get a bit older, uh, and again, even when they are, are still young and they're a church in, in, um, and fellowship about you know, in my energies, maybe if they see there's some old people who are sitting on the side, uh, people like me, uh, that they could say, can I prepare a plate for you and bring it over to them and, and, and serve them in that way? Or your, your board is empty. Uh, would you mind if I, if I filled it? Uh, these are small acts of generosity, of mercy, of love, which I am sure they will, they will really respond to. Uh, but so often we treat them as being these kinds of atoms that are kind of just like circular, you know, circling the, the nucleus, so to speak, and, and they're not really a part of the atom or a part of the molecule. And uh, so I think that there are ways, there are ways to do that. Um, and uh, it's open to, it's open to all of us. Thank you. Very good. And that was a good question. So we really appreciate that. Okay. Thanks. Our time is pretty much up here. So I want to say thank you again and good night to everybody. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.